Good evening. I'm Jonathan Brent, Executive Director of the EVO Institute. And it's a great pleasure on many counts to welcome you, but also to welcome Professor Ephraim Sicher to EVO, which I understand is his first visit uh, to us as a speaker, which is not as it should be. Uh, Professor Sicher's work is well known to any of us and all of us who work in the area of Russian Jewish literature, particularly the work of Isaac Babel. His contribution in this area, I would say, is of key importance on many levels, not only because of his superb uh, scholarship and the academic quality of his work, but he opened up a world that was really closed for a long, long time. And I will speak for a, a brief moment because uh, uh, we're here really to listen to Professor Sicher, but when I was in college and I read Isaac Babel, in the Morrison translation with Lionel Trilling's introduction and read him in a course on European modernism. I read him as a European modernist who happened to be Jewish. I read Kafka as a German writer who happened to be Jewish. I read Freud as a psychoanalyst Viennese psychoanalyst who happened to be Jewish. And all of this happened to be Jewish, never connected. I read Husserl as a philosopher who I knew was Heidegger's teacher and who in 1934 was barred from his university even though he had converted to Lutheranism at the age of 28 but in 1934, he was barred from his university because he happened to be Jewish from birth. And it has, it perplexed me, but it didn't really bother me as someone who was serious about literature, nor did it connect for me even when in Moscow in 1992, I purchased the two-volume com so-called complete edition of Isaac Babel's works and began reading it. And I was sort of relieved in some odd way to find that for the Russians, his Jewishness was completely invisible. There was no mention of it in these two volumes. Uh, the stories weren't bodlerized, but none of the footnotes mentioned it. It concluded the 1920 diary, but even so, he happened to be Jewish, but he was a great writer. And what Professor Sicher's work has done is to re-anchor a great literary figure like Isaac Babel squarely in the world of his Jewishness. He didn't just happen to be Jewish, just as Kafka didn't just happen to be Jewish. It was at the root and of the essence of his work. And so all readers, such as myself, reared largely in a secular tradition, reared with the ambition of world, of, of reaching out into world literature for people such as myself and, and, for peop and for younger generations to come. This work of re-anchoring these great writers in this great tradition is not just a matter of pride. It's not just a matter of nostalgic interest in one's origins. It's a matter of telling the truth about 
the enormous creative genius of the Jewish people and its travails through this history of the 19th and 20th centuries. And so it's with a, a feeling of a great debt to Professor Zicher that I welcome him to this stage. His, um, his work is diverse. He's written on Charles Dickens. He's written on British literature. He's written on the Holocaust. He is a man of great range and profound depth in his understanding. He was born in the United Kingdom, as all good Jews should have been, and received his PhD from Oxford University in 1979. Professor Zicher is widely published, and I would say this book, Jews in Russian Literature After the October Revolution, and his study of, uh, of Babel, the uh, Babel in Context, a study in cultural identity, are the two which those of you here who have come to learn more about Babel's Jewishness, you may wish to get and read because these are essential books for anyone interested in this subject. Uh, but his most recent book is Anti-Semitism, Multiculturalism, Globalization, The British Case, published in 2009. He is currently a professor of literature at Ben-Gurion University in the Negev in Israel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for that very warm uh, welcome. Um, the occasion of my visit to New York is the launching of my new book, uh, Babel in Context, and I aim to put Babel in, back into the context in which he wrote, and which uh, has been uh, unspoken or even unspeakable during the 70 years of communism, and unfortunately, also here in America, uh, uh, not, let's say, not all scholars know Yiddish or aware of basic facts about the Jewish world, even sitting in the New York Public Library and not thinking to ask someone. Um, it, 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 it always amazed me. So uh, the credit doesn't really go to me. It's rather a, a poor reflection on uh, the uh, Omaradzes of uh, some of the scholarly world. Um, I hope this is not being recorded because today, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you a secret that might have repercussions, uh, international repercussions, particularly in the Middle East. I'm going to divulge a secret that, um, well, as you may know, um, there's been talk that the PLO chairman, Yasser Arafat, died an unnatural death. His body was recently exhumed from his grave in Ramallah in order to establish this fact. I can now tell you who was responsible. It was my grandmother, <laughs> Alea Shalom. Who, <clears throat> in her last years, she spoke Yiddish, thinking it was English. And sometimes she spoke Yiddish, thinking it was Russian. She watched the TV news and whenever she saw Mr. Arafat appear on the screen, she would shout at him, a chalera, a misa machina. So now you know, it was my grandmother who was responsible for Arafat's misa machina, his unnatural death. No one else. I tell you this because as Kafka told the assimilated Jews of Prague in 1912, you know more Yiddish than you think. The Germans used to call the way Jews spoke Mauschen, the Poles called it Gislobania, and just as we have become inured to Jew speak in America, that characteristically Yiddish turn of phrase or intonation in English, or the odd Yiddish word, so too the assimilated Jews of Odessa of the early 20th century bequeathed to the Russian language a Jew speak that was to become synonymous with stand up comedy long after Yiddish ceased to be spoken in this Russian city on the Ukrainian shore of the Black Sea, where, by the way, by 1897, a third of the population were Jews. And the man who is remembered as immortalizing the language of Odessa Jews, although 
few Yiddish words actually appear in his Russian prose is Isaac Babel. I'm not talking about stylized Yiddish, but the way Odessa Russian becomes inflected, if not also infected, with a Jewish meaning. So Bello once asked who Isaac Babel was. A writer who knew enough Yiddish to write in Mamaloshan, but who wrote his extraordinary stories of the Russian Civil War and Jewish Odessa in the language of the Pogromshiki. We are all accidents, he asserted, born of a place and a time not of our choosing. Of course, cultural identity is something always in flux and changes the maturity and circumstances, but nobody, nobody is born in a void, and one cannot ignore the unique context of Bible's birth and youth in Odessa, a major cultural center of Russian Jewry in Yiddish and Hebrew before World War I, where Bialik, Mendela, Shomalechim, Ravnitsky, Klausner, and Hadaam were all active. As for Jabotinsky, 10 years of Bible's senior, Russian was Babel's native language, though in Odessa, with its cosmopolitan environment and rival ethnic minorities, as Jabotinsky noted, feelings of pride in Jewish identity were strong. Growing up in an assimilated Jewish family in Odessa, Babel did not choose Russian as his native tongue. It was a fact of life, and it did not mean he was any less immersed in Yiddish. By the end, <coughs> um, it is precisely this context that is all important here, not as a mere matter of biogra biographical fact, but an essential key to understanding a polylingual cultural system, Russian, Yiddish, and Hebrew, which allows the literary work to be addressed to more than one readership. I argue in my book, Bible in Context, that contrary to some commonplace assumptions about the discrete integrity of national literatures, that is, writers belong to only one language, one literature. Barber was able, like many Jewish intellectuals in Russia at that time, to move freely between Jewish and Russian worlds. This was because he had been brought up to acculturate in Russian culture, which, as the historian Yuri Shlotskin emphasizes in the Jewish century, was regarded by upwardly mobile Russian Jews as an entry ticket uh, into social acceptability, despite the discriminatory practices of the Tsarist regime and the anti-Jewish violence of 1881 and again 1905 through 1905, 1904 to 1905. We recall the, the boy in Bible's wonderful childhood story, My First Dovecoat, declaiming Pushkin in his delirium in order to gain the coveted place in the gymnasia. Russian literature was seen as a test of cultural literacy and social acceptance, so that reading a Russian classic becomes a ritual of initiation, a kind of secular bar mitzvah, into cultural maturity. Um, <clears throat> but this doesn't mean that Babel didn't know Yiddish, or that he didn't care about Yiddish, or didn't uh, have a very active role in Yiddish literature and cinema. Uh, after the revolution. Isaac Babel was living in Kiev from 1912 where the Bailis trial took place. And there he published his first story known to us uh, uh, as a contribution to the debate on the Jewish question that raised in the background of that outrageous blood libel case. And so it's from the very beginning that Babel was concerned with the, the questions of Jewish identity and the whole question of the place of Jews in Tsarist Russia. The story, Old Shlomo, is written in a realistic fashion, eliciting pathos in the character of the old man who has been neglected by his children and now watches them in dumb passivity as they prepare to choose apostasy rather than share the fate of the Jews being expelled from the villages. Old Shlomo actually turns in his dumb misery to the, quote, greasy Torah, of his forefathers and hangs himself, an act of despair that paradoxically affirms his Jewish identity. The ending of Bible's story is very different from Shom Alechem's story, Lech Lecha, which is the final story in Tevya the Milkman. Please 
no connection with a musical called Fiddle on the Roof. Shama Lechem's Tevye the Milkman, which closes with Tevye wandering hopelessly from place to place after being expelled from his native Anatevka in the same expulsions described in Bible story. So here we have, a, from the very beginning, a, a, a context of uh, Yiddish literature and a preoccupation that was to last throughout the Bible's career with uh, the historical destiny of the Jewish people. Dehefia thinks of Bielis as suffering for all Jewish people, but between the time Shom wrote the story in 1914 and its publication in 1916, new misfortunes had befallen the Jews, world war and mass deportation from the Eastern Front. Um, for Babel, um, um, the events unfolding before his eyes, uh, before and after the Russian Revolution of 1917, were historical uh, crossroads for the Jewish people. Remember in 1917, um, in the month of November, there were two events. Uh, the October Revolution, which was in November, because they were still keeping to the old Russian calendar, and the Balfour Declaration, two different options uh, for the Jewish people to stay in Russia and fight for the revolution and bring about uh, universal justice for all, or to go to Palestine and set up a Jewish ho homeland. Um, and Bible's uh, great masterpieces, the uh, Civil War epic, uh, Red Cavalry, called Armia, first edition of which was published in 1926, and the Odessa Stories, uh, published uh, from 1921 right into the 1930s, um, each of those two great works uh, have something to say about the fate of the uh, Jewish people. And they're both uh, referring in almost every line, and specifically between lines, to the uh, great classics of modern Yiddish and Hebrew literature. I won't speak so much about Hebrew literature and Bialik today. You can read about that in my book. But since I am at Yivo, I think it's about time that we spoke about um, the role of Yiddish in Babel's uh, story. So I spoke about the first story, uh, Old Shlomo, um, Shalom Aleichem died in 1916, um, and Mandela died in 1917, but not before Babel had actually met the grandfather of Yiddish uh, literature, and I'll perhaps say more about that uh, in a moment. Um, but in 1918, amidst the, the chaos of civil war, when Babel was in starving Petrograd, um, which had been the Russian capital, St. Petersburg, um, he published a story called Shabbos Nachamu. And uh, some of you will know that this is a story in the, uh, in the, among, the among very many about Herschel Ostropola, the 18th century uh, trickster um, who was attached to the court of Rabbi Boruch of Medjugorje. Uh, Rabbi, the Rabbi suffered from melancholy and needed cheering up. But Herschel was not a plain Badkhan of the sort you would find at a Shetu wedding. He was more of a, what we call a let's, who inverts the social hierarchy with carnival laughter. Typically, he turned up at an inn, hungry but penniless. One day, he turned up at an inn, hungry and penniless, as usual, and the innkeeper ordered his wife not to give Herschel a single bite or crumb. Herschel then made nasty threats that if they didn't give him any food, he would do what his father did. The innkeeper became so frightened that he ordered his wife to give Herschel uh, all the goodies they had, whatever he wanted. Only when Herschel had eaten his fill did the innkeeper have the temerity to ask what Herschel's father did when he was not given food. When my father was not given food, answered Herschel, he went to bed hungry. <laughs> now this is a typical Herschel story, lots of Herschel jokes and anecdotes, just like um, the jokes about Martin Chabad and uh, uh, and you know, they, these are, are <clears throat> types that uh, are still with us uh, today, still popular uh, uh, today. Now, um, 
The Maisa met Shabbos Nachamo, which Bible calls Shabbos Nachamo, is a similar tale of wit and cunning applied to simple minded and uh, incredulous Jewish innkeepers. This time, Herschel lets the simple minded innkeeper's wife think he is Shabbos Nachamo. In another version, it is Shabbos Shira, but uh, the version that the Bible has is Shabbos Nachamo. An angel sent from heaven with greetings from her relatives in the next world. The incredulous innkeeper's wife loads up Herschel uh, with lots of food and clothes because you know it's very cold in the next world and you know angels don't get much to eat in fact they don't eat so they obviously are very hungry and how shall they mix off uh, with um, oh, these uh, they fat parcels uh, to take to the next world uh, but it doesn't go far before he stops and thinks what might happen if the innkeeper came back and discovered his ruse then he'd be in trouble if the innkeeper came after him so he hides the loot, strips naked, and stands holding a tree. Sure enough, along comes the innkeeper in hot pursuit of the rascal who poured one over on his wife. But the innkeeper is no smarter than his wife, and how shall I easily convinces him that he is an angel robbed by that same rascal? He persuades the innkeeper to undress and take his place holding up the tree, which is a holy tree on which the whole world depends, so that he can pursue the trickster. Baba does not change the story uh, when he puts it into Russian. However, he retells it with a characteristic humor and imagines a conversation that reads one way in Russian and another if read in Yiddish. But what is remarkable is the place and time of publication besieged Petrograd, the Russian capital at the height of the Civil War in 1918, when writers and everyone else were as hungry as Herschler proverbially was. It appears in the Russian daily which joined Zvezda, the evening star, that also published poetry by Asip Manzostan and others that was filled with apocalyptic images of the dying sun of Petropolis and the death of Russian culture. Along comes Hauschler with Jewish humor, a, a character who was a, a perennial favorite among Jewish readers in East Europe and the States in the 19th, 20th century. Um, and... Uh, uh, makes everyone laugh. In fact, uh, um, Isaiah Trunk, after the Second World War, actually wrote a novel about um, Herschler, uh, presenting him as a redemptive figure. And why not? Shabbos Nachumo is a Sabbath of consolation after Tisha B'Av, the fast commemorating the destruction of the Temple in Jerusalem. And here Russia faces destruction amid a revolution that declares it has come to redeem the world with universal justice. In Red Cavalry, the central protagonist, Lutov, tells the Rebbe um, in the story called The Rebbe that he is putting the tales of Herschler into verse. The Rebbe tells him, no doubt ironically, that is, Jewish readers would recognize the irony, not the Russian readers, that this is a holy task. The jackal moans when he is hungry, and only the wise man rends the veil of existence with laughter, says the Rebbe. And indeed, in a time of extreme cruelty and violence, when the heartland of the Jewish world has been ravaged and turned upside down, what better way to make the world a bit more human again than with some Yiddish humor? And yet for, for Babel, Herschler was a quintessential Luftmensch, just like the Odessa types he celebrated in two sketches published in the same newspaper, The Evening Star, in March 1918, just when Odessa was about to fall to the white pogromshiki and the Jewish world of Odessa began its final decline. Two years previously, in a 1916 sketch entitled Odessa, Babel had prophesied a literary messiah from Odessa who would rejuvenate Russian literature. This would be the Russian Moposon, and we, all, we know about one particular Jew who was devoted to Moposon who came from Odessa. Uh, uh, was he trying to say that he was the literary messiah? I don't know. But now um, um, came the revolution and all restrictions on Jews are lifted. There's no problem in publishing a translation from Yiddish or even from Hebrew in uh, the Russian press. But my question is rather why Herschel 
and why at this particular moment uh, when uh, literally everything is uh, falling apart. And it could be indeed uh, that uh, contrary to Mandelstam, uh, Babel is uh, trying to present a redemptive um, figure who will make the world laugh again. Um, now, Yiddish was Mamalashan for, for uh, Baba, and he <coughs> devoted himself throughout his life to uh, translating Shom uh, He edited translations by his Odessa friend, Simon Gecht, of Shom stories in 1926. It's appeared in two volumes. He wrote titles for a silent film called Jewish Luck, Yiddish Shagrik, the uh, which came out in 1925, based on Shom Aleichem's Nachem Mendel stories, starring uh, Baba's uh, very good friend, the famous <coughs> Yiddish actor uh, Solomon Michoels, and the troupe of the Jewish Moscow Chamber Theatre, which was later the state Jewish Theatre, or Gosset. Despite Mich uh, Michoels' attempt to turn Shom Aleichem's Luftmensch into the deluded dreamer, the stereotypical Luftmensch was, uh, like uh, Herschler, a figure of the Jewish state or who had no place in the new Soviet reality. As Gennady Astrach uh, tells us, a debate raged between hardline Marxists who denounced the bourgeois ideology of Shom Aleichem and those who tried to defend him as a classic of modern Yiddish literature. Later, Shom Aleichem was to be claimed as a voice of the Jewish folk spirit and therefore could pass muster as a suitable um, writer for canon of, of secular socialist Yiddish literature. But in the end, anything smelling of Jewish nationalism was to be hounded out of literature. And finally, in the black years after World War II, Yiddish itself fell suspect of cosmopolitanism. Michalos was murdered, and then the foremost Yiddish writers were arrested and executed in August 1952. Let's go back to 1926. Barbold published a screenplay based on Shom Aleichem's novel, Wandering Stars, Longenja Stern. Barbara's preface contains a political disclaimer in which he distances himself from this ideologically unsuitable material, presumably apologetics necessary to pass censors and party watchdogs. The film was written for Michal's Jewish Chamber Theatre and distributed by the all-Ukrainian film studios, Vufko who had a commercial interest in the huge Yiddish-speaking audience in Soviet Ukraine, as well as a political interest in spreading the message of communism. Now, Wandering Stars is a very, very strange uh, text uh, for uh, propaganda purposes. Shom Aleichem's novel is not one of his best or his most remembered either. It is an apparently simple tale about a poor Candace daughter, Razel, who runs off with the son of a wealthy merchant's son, Label Rafalovich. Not only is Rafalovich unashamedly rich, but this ideological error is presented as praiseworthy and enviable. To make matters worse, the proletariat of the Stetel Holonisti shows no class consciousness, but is occupied most of the day in small talk and gossip. In Sean Malekham's novel, the star-struck teenage lovers Razor and Label run off with a travelling provincial Yiddish theatre troupe that performs Goldfaden and Kumi Leno uh, comedies, as well as clumsy, flimsy plays written by hacks in a Germanized Yiddish. Razor likes to sing Ruzhinka's Mit Mandler from Goldfaden's Shulamis, and like the other Städter dwellers, he's easily taken in by the coarse, uneducated clowns and actors such as Holtzman or Holtzmach. The small town innocents discover the wide world and are transformed by their scheming impresarios into Rosa Spivak and Leo Rafalesco. They then get caught up in the intrigues and, and deceit, the cheap lodgings, shabby clothing and poor acting that go by the name of the Yiddish theatre. Sean Malekin's portrait of the Yiddish theatre is far from flattering. After many adventures, the wandering stars do eventually meet up in the Golden Medina, New York. 
but don't get to marry, perhaps after abandoning the state of a lovely Jewish soul, can only wonder. Shalom Aleichem saw the Yiddish theatre for what it was and was more interested in painting the love story, the story of modern children leaving Babel with the challenge of fitting a rambling plot with a multitude of characters into the genre of the silent movie. No less than Shalom Aleichem, he also needed the money, but the refer referenced world of the, of the film, a seedy Yiddish troupe around 1912, the kind that Kafka seems to have been enraptured with, was a point of reference for the audience's collective memory of the recent past that had been swept away by the revolution. In Barbara's version, the Bessarabian shtetl is moved to Galicia, where it stinks in putrefaction and anticipation of redemption. Reisel is renamed Rachel Rochel Monko and comes to Moscow seeking her lover, who has become a famous violinist. Leo Rogdai, after being spotted by a famous professor, a somewhat less ridiculous version of Shem Aleichem's Yeka, Dr. Levis, who takes him up as a virtuoso. Rogdai allows himself to be corrupted by fame and the luxury of life in the West. Score another point for propaganda. While uh, Rocho learns what it means to be a Jewish illegal in Moscow and spends time in a labor camp after she took upon herself the blame for revolutionary leaflets found in her room in the Doss House. Another point for propaganda. Interestingly, Barber inserted into the film a brief scene of a provincial Yiddish traveling troupe in the forsaken, in the, in the forsaken Galician shtetl, which plays an adaptation of King Lear, possibly inspired by Yaakov uh, Gordon's The Jewish King Lear, the Yiddish Kienig Lear, 1892, which made the Odessa actor Yaakov Adler's reputation on the New York stage uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. In fact, the, apparently the audience thought that Gordon was the original Shakespeare. Called Yaakov Shakespeare. Now you know who Shakespeare really was. Uh, Barber is on record as expressing his dissatisfaction with how the film studio handled his script and his own frustration at not being able to control what was happening on the film set. Apparently, Rogdai's suicide was turned into a happy ending. To make matters worse, to judge by the poor reviews, the film failed to pass master with the ideological requirement that movies give a positive picture of the revolution and malign a decadent evil West. Barber's love for Yiddish is reflected in his lifelong dedication to show the as I said. And in 18, 1936, um, Barber was commissioned to edit Sean Aleichem's complete works for the 80th anniversary of the writer's birth in 1939. Although, unfortunately, the unpublished translations have been lost. Barber was supposed to deliver his translation of the Tevye stories by February 1939, and was determined that Sean Aleichem should not have the Jewish accent he was given in existing Russian translations which he believed distorted the spirit of the Yiddish original and watered down the humor. A Jewish language spoken in Russian was not for Babel a stereotyped jargon, but had to sound natural. Nobody would doubt that Babel shares with Shem Aleichem a Yiddish humoristic style, which comes through in his Russian prose. Indeed, as has been observed, the common basis of Shem Aleichem's stories and Odessa humor may explain the source of Barber's stylization of his Odessa Jewish characters. Barber also translated from other Yiddish authors, including the Yiddish modernist David Belgerson, uh, who wrote a story about New York after <coughs> a brief stay in, in the States, Giro Giro, published in uh, Poland in, uh, in 1929, a tale about an Italian girl in a New York tenement for which um, Barber prepared a um, Russian version that was later apparently revised by Belgerson himself and republished as the author's translation after Barber's arrest when his name could not appear in print and the translator could not be uh, credited. Belgerson himself was executed in August 1952 along with other leading Yiddish writers and rehabilitated around the same time that Barber was during the fall. And then Giro Giro was published for the first time in Russian 
and the selection of Bergeson's works, this time with Barber's name restored as translator. Barber's affinity in spirit rather than style with Yiddish modernists such as Bergeson, Peretz Markish, or Danista uh, remains to be investigated. Nevertheless, Yiddish novels and verse of the Civil War can be compared with Barber's uh, descriptions of the Soviet Polish front, and a similar uh, kind of scars or folk narr narrative is found in David Belgerson's descriptions of bestial savagery during the pogroms in the Ukraine. As Professor Harriet Morav explains in her book on Soviet Yiddish modernism, Music from the Speeding Train, in contrast to the ethos of socialist ideals of forging a new self in Soviet civil war fiction, these works blurred the distinction between the political and the personal. Instead, they were burdened by Jewish memory of war and revolution of the thousands massacred so that, quote, the trope of the festering wound, the open flowing body and the mound, uh, this is a reference to Petz Markish's De uh, Kulpa, were all boundaries to become dominant elements of the artistic text. So it is not only the destruction of the past they lament, but in addition, the failure of the revolution to give birth to something new, end quote. So while Markish shows a Jewish Bolshevik reforming himself into an internationalist in his epic poem, Die Brüder, Brothers of 1929, and identifying with the new Soviet land, he cannot help mourning the destruction of the Jewish communities of the Ukraine in the same civil war which made him what he is. Ultimately, the body and nature overflow in excessive, grotesque images reminiscent of Barbara's own Red Cavalry, postponing any celebration of a new beginning. So we can see the Red Cavalry stories not only in their Russian context of the Civil War uh, novels of the 1920s, but especially in the context of uh, Yiddish uh, poems and novels uh, about the Civil War, which for Jews was a very different kind of experience. It wasn't the, uh, the victorious uh, revolution overcoming uh, the counter-revolutionaries, but a story of the massacre of up to 200,000 Jews in the Polish borderlands and the Ukraine. The ap apocalyptic vision was commonplace in Yiddish and Hebrew prose and poetry and that, that responded to the catastrophe which struck East European Jewry in the years of war and revolution. So it is not surprising to find it also in Barber. I would like now to uh, give another example that compares Barber with a Yiddish modernist who fought also in the Polish Soviet War, but on the Polish side of the same front where Barber happened to find himself as a war correspondent in 1920. And I'm referring to Yisroel Rabon, who published in Yiddish a novel called The Street, Die Gas, in Warsaw in 1928. That's two years after the first edition of uh, Red Cavalry. The narrator, a down-out, discharged soldier, has found casual labor in the circus after wandering the streets, cold and hungry, and waking from nightmares, he relates memories of the Soviet-Polish front. The cross is a source of terror from which the narrator has always recalled in superstitious dread. But when he is wounded on, in the foot and wander, wanders deliriously in the frozen waste, he finds warmth and shelter in a dying Belgian draft horse. After killing the horse, which emits a human cry, he empties its entrails and covered in blood crawls inside the dead beast. I'm, I'm sorry, this is really disgusting. <laughs> um, only in the morning, to his horror, that he discover that he has frozen to the spot, his arms outstretched and outstretched in the shape of a cross. Gott meine, ich bin gewähn eingewachsen a reuter blutiger Zellem. Ich, a blutiger reuter Zellem, was steckt in der Erde. Ich, a blutiger Zellem, auf ein weiß russischen Stepp. My God, I was rooted to the earth like a bloody red cross. I was a bloody cross on the Belarusian steppe. Having been metamorphosed into a terrifying symbol of negation of Jewish identity, the crucified soldier breaks free from his macabre imprisonment, but then realizes that the dead horse's eyes are accusing men of bestiality, and that he has become part of that bestiality. Um, you find 
very similar sentiments in Baba. Remember the um, description of the pogrom in um, <coughs> uh, the um, childhood stories, uh, story of my dovecote and my first love, where Baba describes the knees of a horse as being kind. And in this same compassion he finds in horses uh, underlines the lack of compassion uh, in the Cossacks and the uh, pogrom makers. Um, and of course both Rabon and Baba were modernists and they very often literalize metaphor. Um, the, um, here the frozen landscape is totally bereft of any sign of redemption, Christian or communist. And, the no and Rabon's novel closes with the narrator who has despaired of finding work or love in Wuch, descending into the coal mines as snow covers the earth in a naturalistic ending befitting Zola. Rabon expresses the Kafkaesque estrangement of his self from the world of death and despair. In Barbara's Red Cavalry, the alienated Jewish intellectual Lutov has a similarly surrealistic experience on the Bolshevik side of the Polish Soviet front. When he is dragged in his sleep by his horse to the front line, he has an erotic dream of his own death in which the mysterious Margot prays to Jesus to receive his soul. But when he awakes, he finds himself a few steps away from the front line next to an anti-Semitic peasant watching a pogrom in the town below who prophesies the extinction of the Jewish people. He manages to extricate himself with difficulty, but then, as in another Red Cavalry story, My First Goose, he behaves violently towards a Polish landlady in order to force her to feed him before he has to flee Polish machine gunners who have taken up position in the village. That premonition of death, as happened in the opening Red Cavalry, crossing the Zbruch, has brought him to witness a pogrom, but he has strangely distanced himself from his own death and that of his fellow Jews. But Bavol and Ashur Rabon express despair and defeat on different sides of the Soviet Polish front with modernist images of par paralysis and estrangement that distance the self from any human um, identity. Um, I think there are many examples of, of Baba's descriptions of the destroyed uh, shtetl in, in the Red Cavalry that uh, can be compared, or have been compared with Paris Marquis, particularly de Cooper, uh, his great pogrom um, poem of 1921. Um, um, but let's come back to Adessa and, and to Yiddish. The often playful relationship of Hebrew and Yiddish was quite commonplace not only in Michael Mendel's Sephorium, who switched from Hebrew to Yiddish and back again, but in numerous jokes that play on double meanings in Hebrew and Yiddish. Diglossia was the rule, not the exception. As Baal Machshovus uh, reminded Russian Jews at the height of the language wars between Bundes, Zionists and, com and, community, and communists. Right? It was about Baal Machshovus who talked about one literature, Ein Anziger Literatur, uh, not Yiddish and Hebrew separately and Russian separately, but one Jewish uh, literature. Um, in Shom Aleichem, uh, in Shom Aleichem, Diglossia, lost in translation, creates Schumer out of Tevye's malapropisms and misquotations from the Bible and prayer book. Um, but for Bible, it's not so much um, Diglossia, uh, but the form another form of literary bilingualism, when he plays on the meaning of Yiddish idioms and stylized phrases in his Russian prose. Yiddish-speaking readers would have enjoyed the playful translation or calking into Russian of idiomatic or typical Yiddish expressions. Barbara's Shabbos Nachamu, for example, um, has uh, quite a few jokes in Yiddish, for example, when the innkeeper's wife um, tells uh, Hersha, that her husband feeds her on, on promises, um, um, or uh, that uh, her, her husband is a, uh, uh, for every wife, uh, her, her husband is a, a, a mensch, uh, um, but her own only feeds her with promises. Well, in Russian, that doesn't mean very much. But if you know Yiddish, you know the Yiddish idioms, um, uh, you can read the, the, uh, uh, the Yiddish original of, of the uh, Russian or 
read between the lines, which Jews always have been very good at doing. Um, another example, Elia Zakovich and Margarita Prokofievna, a short story of 1916 about an Odessa Luftmensch who sp spends the night with a Russian prostitute in order to evade the restrictions on Jewish re residents. However, in Barbara's rendition, the phrases mean one thing in Russian and another uh, in um, Yiddish. I'm going to skip the next 50 pages. Uh, um, and there are many, many jokes in the Odessa story. That the names always mean something. Uh, the Ofka Buik is an ox, but Buik is uh, Russian, Ru Russian for an ox. Uh, but, and Froem Gratch is a rookie. Um, but the Quicks, uh, they're uh, the Shriers, uh, they're the Shouters. Peace has departed from the house of the Quicks. I call it Ushol, is Doma Krikov. Uh, it's a very funny joke because they're Quicks, they're, they're, they're Shriers, they, they, they shout. Um, um, Madame Golubchik has definitely raising a yell from Mendel. Right? Once he's knocked down, so she says, shout something, Mendel. Of course, he has to shout. He's, he's, he's the quick, he's the shy. Um, uh, the innkeeper's, innkeeper's name in Apollo is Shmel. And he behaves like a Shmel running off after Apollo uh, when he doesn't pay, his, um, uh, pay for his meal. Uh, Apollo, uh, someone suggested, uh, Apollo. Uh, this Polish painter is Apollo, a drunkard, a liar. Uh, sorry to any Poles here, but <laughs> a common Yiddish uh, pejorative term. Um, in the Red Cavalry story, the Rebbe, which I've already mentioned, the Rebbe identifies Lutov as a Jew. From where does a Jew come? Now, a Russian looks at this rather perplexed. What a strange way of talking to someone. In fact, the typeset of the first edition of Red Cavalry put a comma. Uh, from where uh, do you come? Jew. <laughs> Those of you who know Yiddish recognize the common form of address of one Jew to another. From then and come to Yid. So that however much Lutov has cut himself off from his past and denies his Jewishness, the Rebbe immediately identifies him as a Jew, as any Jewish reader will, will notice. Um, when Lutov identifies himself as a Jew from Odessa. He deserves the Rebbe's ironic reference to Odessa as the star of the exile, a conventional term for God-fearing city of devout sages, for it was infamous as a hotbed of secular enlightenment, Haskalah, and vice. <laughs> you know, the, the common Yiddish saying uh, that Odessa was encircled 10 miles around by the fires of hell. Okay. Uh, Zen Mil von Odess, Brent der Gehinnen. Rather, the exchange between Lutov and the Rebbe contrasts two Jewish worlds, Odessa and Jutomir, a contrast echoed elsewhere in the Red Cavalry stories between the traditional shtetl and the cosmopolitan bustling port on the Black Sea. And of course, any Jewish reader would read that in the story, but Russian readers, of course, would completely miss the reference. Um, Gedele tells Lutov that Hasidism is indestructible in the storm of history. But at the end of the story, Lutov turns his back on the destroyed uh, Stetor and the dead world of the Rebbe. He reports for duty on the agate prop train, whose bright lights and red star the antithesis of a dying, dying Stetor and Jewish past. The Jewish reader, however, would not be taken in by this propaganda ending. He would have noticed that um, Gadali has said that he's one of the Galanta Leute, one of the uh, learned people of the, of the Stato, and he knows what justice is, even though the revolution has taken away from him, a pogrom victim, his last possessions. And he believes in a new international, a fourth international of good people. Um, to refer is to engage dialogically with the surrounding ideological and historical discourse, as well as the linguistic deep structure of word, sound, and image. To refer is to recover a cultural memory which has been destroyed by history, 
but which is available to those readers with the linguistic tools and cultural knowledge to decipher the coded ethnic or ideological subtext. The resulting quotations inevitably conflict with other semantic associations in the text, creating humor out of semantic multiplicity and ambiguity. Um, here in Gadali, interference of a Jewish language, stylized Yiddish, and reference to Jewish texts, Maimonides or Rashi, introduces the referential frame of a condemned culture to which the alienated Jewish intellectual is nostalgically drawn. Luther looks around Jutimir on a Friday evening for the shy star, which tells him the Sabbath has set in. And that's a reference that the English translator, the American translator, failed to understand. Um, and Jews will go to the synagogue to pray. This is a referential sign of a way of life ruined by pogroms and war. Luther has turned its back on the Jewish past, but he cannot come to terms with the violence of the revolution which is destroying that past or overcome his own humanitarian Judaic values. Gedele is a story that engages Jewish readers with Lutov's Jewish past by going back to Jutomir, Bialik's native town, and reminding us that we are, as in Bialik's poem, before the book cupboard. However, the alienated Jewish intellectual who returns to the world of the base Midrash and Jewish traditions, the world of Lutov's grandparents, is not the young man uh, in, 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 in Bialik's poem attracted a quarter of a century previously by the winds of the Haskalah and modernity. Rather, this is the Russian Jew who has joined the revolution, which is dealing the death blow to the decaying uh, shtetl, dispossessing the Jewish traders and bringing in the wake pogroms on a scale not previously seen in Russia and the Ukraine. Here, the Jewish bookshelf is a nostalgic memory that pours Yutov towards his severe roots in the Jewish past, on Sabbath Eve, the thick sadness of memories wears me down. Once on these evenings, my grandfather's yellow beard stroked the volumes of Ibn Ezra. My old grandmother, in a lace head covering, weaved her crooked fingers over the Sabbath candles and cried sweet tears. My child's heart rocked on those evenings like a little ship on enchanted waves. And you'll recognize here the idiom for the sea of the Talmud. It is, a search, it is in, in search of this Jewish memory in the Jewish bookshelf that Lutov engages uh, an old shopkeeper in Jutimir, Gadali, in conversation one Friday evening when red troops have taken the town. Lutov brutally rebuts Gadali, who has studied Rashi and Maimonides, and the silk straps emanating from his blinded eyes mark him as a Zaydana Mensch, a learned uh, Jew, but Lutov has no answer when the old Jew asks where is the justice and universal happiness promised by the revolution. Maimonides and Hebrew poetry are the reference points also in the last effects of Ilya Vodslavsky, the renegade son of the Chernobyl Rebbe, who joined the communists in the vain hope of reconciling Lenin and Maimonides, party pamphlets and love. As, as you are aware, and I don't have to tell you, uh, to call a Rebbe Bratslavsky, the Bratslav, uh, uh, is uh, obviously ironic because, as you know, uh, Nachman of Bratslav left no son who was the last Rebbe of Bratslav. But rather, the legitimate Rebbe, who, who actually was called Tversky, um, appears in the fictional story uh, of Red Cavalry as uh, the father to a redemptive figure uh, very much in line with um, uh, the Bratislava's uh, messianism. And um, uh, um, at the end of Red Cavalry, Ilya fails, he dies. And yet Lutov, um, when he receives the last breath of his brother, identifies with, with uh, Ilya Bratislavsky and the storm of history which is raging inside him represents that open-ended dialectic which is never resolved uh, in Barbara's Red Cavalry story of the alienated Jewish intellectual who has placed himself to the revolution but cannot tear himself away from the Jewish world, the world of Yiddish. Given Barbara's Yiddish view of the world, it should not be surprising that his stories were quickly translated into Yiddish, 
uh, many stories published as they came out in Russian uh, in uh, Yiddish newspapers um, in, in Poland, uh, translated by uh, Kittel Meisel and uh, uh, called Feldman and many others, as well as in, in Kharkov and other places in, in Russia. In 1925, the Kiev Kultur Liga, uh, which spearheaded Yiddish avant-garde writing and art before it was taken over by the communists, brought out a slim volume of Bible stories with no indication that they were translations. Uh, I've told that uh, this, in fact, was probably the policy of, of the Kultur Liga. But who knows? Perhaps Isaac Bible did write Mamaloshan after all. But in Yiddish, now I've read these uh, translations, you don't see the joke. It's mostly uh, idiomatic Yiddish. The Odessa stories are so funny and so uniquely Bible because he's speaking Yiddish in Russian. Not like my grandmother, Manuchas Eden, or Leah Rosson's Mr. Kaplan, because the languages have fused, but on the contrary, because it is only in Russian that Jewish readers can hear the Yiddish. Thank you very much. <laughs> if there are any uh, comments, questions, and a glass of water, I would be very grateful. Right. Right. Well, I must say that there have been different translations of, of Babel. Um, there's the Peter Constantine translation of the so-called complete works edited by Natalie Bible, which unfortunately is not complete. Uh, some things were deliberately or not deliberately left out. And the texts are based on the two-volume um, edition of the stories that came out immediately at the, uh, well, at, right at the end of the Soviet period, based on Soviet versions, some of which still uh, are, are censored. Um, and um, there is this uh, Penguin edition, Isaac Barber read covering other stories in a very ungraceful um, uh, um, in, in a rather ungraceful uh, translation by David Macduff. And I'm sorry to say this is my edition um, based on uncensored text. Um, at least Macduff got the idea that there was Yiddish in Babel, but unfortunately he put in Yiddish where it wasn't in the Russian. <laughs> and um, uh, here it says, um, uh, all this when Shabbos Dachmul comes. And I thought, is this a person from the other world? Well, the innkeeper's wife actually thinks that um, Shabbos Dachmul is a person. She's so stupid, she doesn't realize it's a, a Shabbos. Um, uh, well, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a joke, it's a story, and um, um, I have the original Yiddish, and I, I have the different English translations, I have Russian translations of the original. Uh, um, Barbara is very, very playful um, with the Yiddish original. Um, but what I'm saying is that it's not so much that he's speaking Yiddish in Russian, but rather that it works both ways, that when the innkeeper's wife says... Um, um, uh, a, a, a man like any man, right? It, it's very obvious to the Jewish reader that she's saying, a man for your bench, right? By Yedah vibe, is a man a mensch. You know, a man only feeds beyond promises. Right? The Yiddish idiom. That's what I'm talking about. Um, uh, and don't forget that this is a Russian newspaper at the height of the Civil War, right? We're probably with a uh, large Jewish readership, but the main readership was, was Russian. So what's the point of making jokes in Yiddish if you're, some of your readers don't know Yiddish? And I'm suggesting that for Barbara, the main thing was that Herschel was a kind of Luftmensch. Uh, and he often talks about the Luftmensch of uh, Odessa, like um, uh, Elia Izakovich in, in the story, Elia Izakovich and Margarita Prokofievna. It was Luftmensch, which is his favorite character. But you couldn't start talking about Lothar mentioned, mentioned like uh, Menachem Mendel in the Shalom Lechner stories after the revolution for very long uh, because Lothar is the most uh, unlikely uh, hero of a revolutionary story. Um, he's the guy who, what, he goes from town to town uh, and um, um, flies over the town in the Yiddish idiom of going from house to house, or 
even the Heiser, the Heiser, uh, uh, you know, there's a Chagall painting which shows uh, the Lotharmensch flying over Vitebsk. It's a beautiful painting. And of course, most of the critics don't get it. You know, there, there's symbolism in the man, larger than life, flying over a town, and they'll write books about, about that, sorry, about, about symbolism. And of course, Yiddish viewers of, uh, of that painting know that it's a literal translation of the Yiddish. And, and you've got the similar kind of thing in the uh, Bible's Russian. There are many, many examples, uh, which uh, obviously I, I can't give for what, lack of time, but uh, um, Bob had great fun. Uh, and the, 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 the Yiddish jokes in that house of story are not in the original Yiddish. Right? He, he did rewrite it, but he wrote it for me, rewrote uh, Montpassant, you should see his translations of Montpassant. Uh, which are also great fun, and it just very subtly changes the whole idea of Maupassant's story just by changing a few words. More questions or comments? Can you take one more? Sure. That same story, yes. that same story, when the innkeeper's wife is feeding her shit, mm -hmm. And the butter, yes. Yeah. Butter, butter, that's right. Jonathan, butter. It's, it's butter. He, he and it, the, uh, Jonathan said that word also means oil. Yes, but it's case, oil. In that case, the two translators missed it. Well, well, the question is, how many people here, when they're making chicken soup on Friday mornings, put oil in their soup? Now, my grandmother, I will show them, put schmaltz in. She was always cooking with chicken schmaltz. Right. Very bad for your health, I know. But not oil. Right. And, and I puzzled about that. I don't know if it's a mistake or Bob was just uh, uh, be, um, be, be, it's slipping up. But the, in Russian it says maslo, which is butter. It's either butter or oil. But it's not schmaltz. Right. And it's very odd. I mean, maybe a Russian reader wouldn't notice that. A Jewish reader would notice that there was a, a apparent mistake. Uh, um, but Barbara grew up in the desert. He knew Jewish life. It's not like today, either you're religious uh, and, and you have a long beard and a hat and you go to synagogue or you're secular and you read Philip Roth or what. You know, it, there wasn't a dichotomy. Jews in Odessa lived a Jewish life. They weren't religious. I mean, Odessa was the last place to be called religious. Uh, it, it was the epitome of, of the Haskalan, of secular Jewish life. But they went to synagogue, they went to the Brody synagogue, where Pinchas Minkowski was the cousin with his choir of 60 children in how it was done in Odessa. This same Pinchas Minkowski turns up to the cemetery with his choir of 60 children uh, to sing at Josef Morgenstein's uh, funeral. Um, it's not an invention by Barbara. Barbara didn't invent anything. Uh, and so, you know, if you look at translations of Bible, there's no comment who was Pinchas Minkowski, right? because no one knows. Right? But we know, they know in Yivo who he is. There's a, a beautiful picture of, of Minkowski and the choir. It's a shame I, I can't show it to you at the moment. Uh, in the Yivo archives. And I'm very grateful to, to Yivo for letting me use it in, in, in the book. But it's an example of how immersed Bible was in a Jewish world. And so when he's writing in Russian, which was his native tongue, um, there's no uh, dichotomy between Russian and, and uh, Jewish. Morgenstein is killed by the only way he can be killed in Yiddish. A bullet, Stein, in the Morgen, in the stomach. That's why it's Morgenstein. So the poor deceased Morgenstein has to be Morgenstein. Right? Because he's killed with a stone in the stomach uh, by one of the gangsters. Right? Yiddish readers would get that. Uh, the German translators didn't get it. They changed the name because they thought it was a very strange name. <laughs> but, but the English translators don't, don't recognize it either. They, they, there's no note or comment uh, about that. Yes, yes please. Uh, which I could have read, but and I could have continued till, the, uh, as it said in Haggadah, the students come tell us to read Krishna um, in the morning, but I, I spared you that. And I had a whole section there about Odessa Russian. And the thing about Odessa Russian is that it was a very special kind of Russian that was spoken in Odessa at the beginning of the 20th century. And 
it was uh, influenced in its grammar, its lexicon, its syntax by a mixture of Yiddish and Ukrainian and Russian, um, especially spoken in Modzvanka by the poor uh, section of the population. If you read Jabotinsky's The Five, Piatro, uh, you'll see some examples of a very different kind of Odessa Russian, um, not the, the slang of Modzvanka, which uh, was renowned for its poverty and criminality, although someone's checked the statistics and found that Jews are not, repeat, not overrepresented uh, as criminals in the period 1905 to 1910. Um, and when Barbel uses uh, that address Russian in his stories, it becomes, for everyone who reads uh, Barbel, an example of Dessa Russian. They forgot that it was Barbel. And all these Dessa Russians. Uh, phrases often picked up from Barbara, and it's a question of life following art. Uh, everything's the opposite the, the way around. The Pink for Kedza, it's the life uh, following art, and everyone's saying, well, uh, that suggests a Russian, but they forgot it was Barbara's Russian, which is not exactly the same. Um, Barbara um, wrote a stories about an Odessa gangster who flourished around 1913 called Benya Creek, Bencion Creek. And of course, to talk about a Jew under the Tsar who claims to be the king, as the police constable, police officer says, the police commander says, um, where there is a Tsar, there can be no king. This is a travesty of reality. It's imagining as many Yiddish and Hebrew writers did, uh, as uh, uh, Sean Ash did, and Varshavsky, and Bialik, uh, the Balguf, the strong guy who has all the power that the Jews did not have. Um, now, here's a revelation, another revelation today. Misha Yaponchik, who is supposed to be the real life prototype of Benya Creek, was not a very nice person. He was a thug, he was nasty. Right? His real name was um, uh, Moshe Yaakov Vinitsky. And um, uh, whilst Barbara's uh, gangsters uh, shoot in the air, otherwise you might kill a person. Uh, Vinitsky's, or um motto was, don't leave witnesses. He was locked up by the Soviet authorities, uh, possibly for political activity. He was only released during the February Revolution. Right? Remember that Benya Creek uh, is described as flourishing around 1913, before the revolution. Benya Crick kill, uh, uh, Benya Crick's gangsters raid Tartakovsky's offices and one of the gangsters comes along drunk and shoots Josef Morgenstein, right? Um, <clears throat> and Benya Crick gives Josef Morgenstein and also the other gangster a splendid funeral um, at which Minkowski comes with his choir, as I told you. Vinitsky has an entirely different story, but ends the same way. Vinitsky joined the Reds uh, to fight the whites, to defend the Jewish population of Odessa from the white pogromchiki. Of course, Vinitsky knew that the Reds were going to eliminate all the anarchists and the bandits. So if you can't beat them, you join them. He joined the Reds with his gangsters as a separate squadron. Um, and of course, their, their idea was that they'd get a lot of loot. And uh, uh, in the name of the revolution, they would relieve a lot of rich people of their fur coats and their jewelry. And it was very, actually very, very dangerous on just the streets when Japonchik was around that you could go out on the street and suddenly find you had no coat left and no money in your pocket. Um, the danger was not only from the, from the pogromchiki. Um, the Reds, however, played a trick on Vinitsky. They uh, had his squadron on a train, which they ambushed, and he was killed. He was given a, a, a military funeral, um, in, in, uh, not in Odessa, in another Russian town, but they brought Pinkas Mikovsky along with his choir. And this was a dreaded figure, right? I can imagine that Pinkovsky was probably quaking in his, in his shoes. But that was 1918. 
1913. So why would Barber rewrite this story and backdate it to 1913, before the revolution, when in fact the story that was in real life was uh, actually after the revolution? Um, I think the answer is in the film that Barber made of the Jesser stories called Benya Creek, which came out in 1927. And there, Barber, for obvious political reasons, has to rewrite his stories um, and make Benya Crick the kind of uh, popular figure that you describe, a Robin Hood who takes from the rich and gives to the poor to make himself a bit more revolutionary. Um, and, and there were stories about Vinitsky that popularized him, but he, he really was horrible and nasty. Um, uh, in the film, Benya Crick is also shown uh, during the February Revolution as being somehow sympathetic to the Reds. However, the real hero is introduced, not in the original stories, a baker uh, who organizes the proletariat against the evil bourgeoisie represented by Tavdokovsky. And Tavdokovsky is the Jewish villain of the, of the film. Um, and what we see at the end is when uh, Benya Crick is ambushed as Japonchik was, um, the, um, justice has been done. That is to say, now the Soviet communists can plan the new uh, future um, now that order has been restored and there are no more bandits. Um, did Barber really, really believe that? Look at the later Odessa stories, Freundgrauch, for example, which describes the um, capture and execution in cold blood of Freund Grouch, one of the last uh, Odessa gangsters still alive after the revolution. And along comes the uh, Cheka, the secret police officer from Moscow to supervise the rounding up of the gangsters. A local Cheka agent tells him, you won't understand what that man represented. He represented Odessa. There was always this nostalgia for the old Odessa that no longer existed after the revolution. Um, a sto another story, the end of the old folks' home, Kanyez Begadiani, shows how the, um, the Jewish beggars in the cemetery have been making a lot of money by reusing the same coffin. And along comes Broidin, the Jewish communist, and puts an end to it and throws them all out of the old folks' home. Um, and they wander off, uh, bedraggled and looking very pathetic. Um, this is not exactly a way of describing the new glorious Soviet future, but I was very aware that what had been destroyed, the Jewish culture of Odessa, um, could never be uh, restored. For us, it was the end of a chapter in Yiddish and Hebrew literature. Bialik was allowed to leave Russia from Odessa in 1921, but it's not very well known that he was almost uh, shot by a white officer. Um, and, and if he had not got out of Odessa, with uh, other um, Jewish uh, writers and the, uh, um, and the, the Habima theater also got out, um, this, uh, the story of Hebrew literature would be very different. We wouldn't ha be thinking of Bialik, the great nationalist uh, poet who lived in Tel Aviv and walked around with Mayor Dizengoff and uh, uh, we would only have the Bialik of, of, Rus of the Russian period and the great Pogrom poems and his tragic death in 1921. So things could have been very different, but it was definitely the end of an era. Um, I'll just perhaps finish with a, a story called Karl Yankel, which is about a show trial of a moral in Odessa in 1929. Um, during the 20s, the Jewish communist, the Yevsekia, um, organized mock trials of Judaism uh, and uh, many rabbis and morals were arrested. Sometimes uh, there were just uh, staged presentations, but sometimes it was a real trial, as in this case. And Naphtali, the moral represents old Odessa, the Jewish Odessa. Um, and this was published in, in 1931, and also in Paris, almost simultaneously, and it proved very embarrassing to Babel because people seized on this as an attempt to try almost to apologize for old Odessa and Jewish Odessa. It ends with um, uh, a very interesting ending, uh, a closure. Um, the, the boy has been called Karl after Karl Marx because his father wants to be admitted to the Communist Party and he can't 
uh, be admitted if his circumcised his son. Uh, but the grandmother, who is a from a Yidin, from um, uh, Medjubozh, uh has the, the, the boy secretly circumcised and named Yankel. That's why it's called Karl Yankel. So it, it's Karl for the Soviet future, Yankel for the old Jewish past, or is it a contradiction? Um, the story ends with the narrator musing um, uh, and looking at the scene in the courtyard where the communists are pointing to the Hasidim who have come to see Jerusalem on trial and shouting down with them. Um, the battle flared up. Karl Yankel, his eyes fixed unse unseemingly on me, unseeingly on me, um, sucked the Kyrgyz woman's breast, like the brotherhood of the Soviet people. Was. The woman was slightly pockmarked. From the window flew the straight streets that I had walked all over in my childhood and youth. Pushkin Street stretched towards the station. Small Arnold, little Arnold Street extended into the park beside the sea. I had grown up in these streets. That was Karl Yankel's turn. But no one had fought for me as they were fighting for him. Not many people had much, been much concerned with me. It's impossible, I whispered to myself, that you will not be happy, Karl Yankel. It's impossible that you will not be happier than I. Now that's a very ambiguous ending. As if to say that the new generation of Soviet Jews who have been liberated from Jewish practices will somehow be happier. Until we notice that what those streets are called that he's looking at. Pushkin Street, representing Russian cultural identity, and Little Arnold Street. Who lived on Little Arnold Street? Chaim Nachman Bialik. Of course, everyone in this letter knew that. You say Little Arnold Street, you'd know that was Bialik's house until 1921. The two paths of culture, Russian culture, Hebrew and Yiddish culture, were now diverging. They could never to come back together again. Thank you. I have one uh, small announcement to make, um, which is, again, another um, uh, accident uh, curiosity. Uh, about three years ago, we began a project to translate uh, a vegetarian cookbook that was published in Vilna in 19, 1938. This uh, vegetarian cookbook uh, took us all by surprise here at Evo. We had a copy. There are only two copies, uh, uh, as we know it, uh, that are extant. One, I believe, in Israel and one here um, at Evo. And uh, this book was published in Vilna, as I said, and it was from a restaurant uh, owned by Fania Lewando. Fania Lewando was a famous cook at the time. All the famous people, the literati, came to her restaurant. Uh, Mark Chagall signed her guest book. Uh, Katja Ginsky, Sutzkever. How wonderful the food was. And then, by chance, we discovered that she had a living relative and that relative is Ephraim Zicher. <laughs> and so we are delighted uh, to announce uh, that this book will soon be published uh, in English translation. And all of you who uh, may have your heart set on preparing good vegetarian Jewish food will be able to have a very good new style of cooking as a result. Um, Barbara, when, when are we expecting publication? Uh, 2014. 2014. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, we've seen the proofs of the book. It's quite beautiful. And in any case, we're very grateful uh, to Professor Zicher for um, uh, being here to help us uh, memorialize uh, the publication of this book today as well. Thank you.